As I said several months ago, this would be the year that we take a look at some notable entries in Italian R. And then I slipped and fell in a well of more what-the-fuck Hollywood movies. <laughs> what? It's easy to get distracted when one minute you're watching Anthony Quinn's Ghost Against a Black Backdrop, and the next minute you're watching a dog rescue other dogs from a slaughterhouse. My attention span easily gets lost! Poor dumb cop! <laughs> you don't think I'm supposed to be about your pinpoint me with your stupid tracing machines, do you? <laughs> figures we'd be talking about another Lucio Fulci movie. It's like going to the roulette table and either betting on red or black. You know, it's either going to be Lucio Fulci or Dario Argento. But then again, there is the wild card of Bruno Mattei. Hmm. I haven't been to Vegas in a while. Arguably, director Lucio Fulci's most controversial film is the 1982 Giallo Sleazefest, The New York Ripper, a movie often criticized for its seeming hatred of women and buckets of on-screen sex and violence. It's a movie about a serial killer stalking women in the streets of New York City. And I agree with the other critics. It should be about a serial killer who loves women. I expect only quality cinema to be released on DVD under shameless screen entertainment. And look at this poster. It's clearly ripping off this Italian poster that I have behind my chair. I'm not sure what this poster is for, but it's obvious that the word Ripper in the title has a double meaning. The New York Ripper opens with a sweeping shot over Too Soon Harbor. Things are really quiet this time around when there aren't zombies walking across the bridge. Uh-oh, a man and his dog. I'm assuming the dog talks. Yeah, eight hours behind the counter is no fun either. What does that dog know about working eight hours? Oh, it was the guy talking. I just don't know what animals can or can't talk anymore. I don't see what's so sexist about playing fetch. It's a girl dog, too. He's getting her into sports. That a girl. Good girl. Now bring it here. Come on. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. That's it. That's it. You're such a good girl. That's the look of a man who just noticed that his girl dog has a penis. Or that that's not a stick. Good girl, not only did you fetch a severed hand, but you fetched a severed hand that is amazing at playing a funky soundtrack. What would Tequila say in this situation? Not one donut, no candy bars, no burritos. Is everybody going on a diet in this place or what? What does that have to do with anything? It's really easy to copyright your music when those doing the copywriting are deaf. You can put in any music you want, they can't hear it. Our hero is Lieutenant Fred Williams, and I guess taking out an O and an N from the last name is the difference between this guy and mean Johnny Barrows. Lieutenant Williams meets with the former landlord of the severed hand, Mrs. Williams. Weisberger. This the girl? Oh yes, Lieutenant, that's her all right. <laughs> I'm sorry, do you want to fuck the hand? Maybe she can give some insight, such as what's on TV in 1982. I remember that because I just turned on Dallas. You know, that TV series about that family that has money coming out of its ears? Just wait until it's remade with a bunch of CW-style douchebags in 2012. That's the real hit of the Dallas franchise. Since she doesn't spoil who shot JR, maybe she can let us know about the strange phone calls she received from the killer. And she got this telephone call from this, some um, person. Strangest voice I ever heard. Sort of like a duck. I have it on good authority that J.R. was not shot by Darkwing Duck. That should be enough information for Lieutenant Williams to be hot on the case. 
Eleven people a day are murdered here in Fun City, and over half of them are women. Goodbye. The other half, unfortunately, are bicycles, so this girl is in a lot of trouble. If they put in the police squad theme, wherever she's going is going to be hilarious. I don't really see anything sexist happening so far. God damn it! You women should stay home where you belong. You're a menace to the public. And you've got the brains of a chicken. And you're an asshole. <laughs> if he's mad now, wait till he finds out she also plays video games. The girl happens to be catching the same ferry as Andrew Dice Carr, so she takes a nod from Linda Evans and writes shithead on the windshield. That's one step beyond that jerk Mitchell. Well, if that's who catches her, at least she can get a six-pack of beer. Please, you're not a police officer, are you? I wouldn't think of that. No, ma'am, we're just shooting a movie called The New York Ripper. You might want to get out of here. Clue one. The killer is at least handsome enough for her to let him get in the car with her. Stupid! I got her even pick up! <laughs> Ugh, this is the second worst thing Donald Duck has done, right next to becoming a Nazi. <laughs> I've got a bad feeling about Nameless Bicycle Girl. Her body is found when every other car leaves, except for the one that she's in. But where's the guy who owns it? It wasn't her car. Shouldn't the owner of the car have found her body? Maybe he was busy writing a negative review of Fury Road. Not sure why we're in the coroner's office. I already saw how she died. He used a blade. He stuck it up her joy trail and slit her wide open. I'll thank you to leave the term joy trail out of the official report. It's bad enough you put the term fun box in the first girl's report. Uh, something tells me everything this guy says is going to be gross. I bet my denture she was. She was done in by the same guy. The last time, none of us are going to hold your dentures, even if your favorite fetish is to be gumming it. But most importantly, we got to get this cameo out of the way. Yeah. Hmm. Well, well, well. So Mr. Director is jealous that I got Edward Mannix's voice this time and not you. Better luck next time. You'll we'll have to settle for whoever's voice this is. The important thing, though, Fred, is that New Yorkers believe we have the situation firmly under control. That the Metropolitan Force is an example of perfect efficiency. Got it? Mm -hmm. Can we just make Lucio Fulci sound like Burt Young and get it over with? And I'm not entirely convinced that Lieutenant Williams is the best cop for this job. Hey, somebody called for you. Yeah, who? Guy with a strange voice. Said he called back. Sounded just like a duck. Like a duck? I've never heard that before. Maybe from the landlady who said that the killer sounded like a duck? How many people come up to you and say that they talk to someone who sounds like a duck? How could you forget that? Lieutenant Williams goes to visit Paolo Malco. He once had to deal with a house by the cemetery. He's perfect for this case. Malco plays Dr. Paul Davis, a psychotherapy professor who was hired to create a profile for the killer. You were expecting an old coot with silver temples and a German accent? No, I was expecting someone with a German accent in real life, but with a dubbed Long Island accent in the movie. Let's hope they get what they pay for here. It's about that maniac who loves to slash young girls to death, right? How did you guess that? I eat oodles of carrots. Hmm, what you say is confusing, which leads me to believe that you're the best person for the job. You let me have all the data and we wait for him to butcher another girl. Perfect strategy. I like what I hear. Instead of stopping him before the next crime, we wait for him to kill again. That way we don't waste our effects budget. The economy seems strong on 42nd Street circa 1982. Girls are only a quarter. I love having to decide between a girl and a gumball. Look at this suspicious guy. Not sure what color that shirt is, but it's definitely red herring. This place has it right. Why film the porn and show it on a screen when you can just have the sex right in front of you? And yet, people will still show up to bootleg it. <laughs> what the hell? A woman jerking off in a porn theater? I come here to masturbate with other dudes, goddammit! And bravo for the performance, milady. How did it go? Eh. Faker! 
We're following this girl, so something bad is gonna happen to her. Oh shit! Where's that green light coming from? This is very confusing lighting. That prick bastard Italian. Shh! The director is right behind the camera. Well, the red herring is gone, probably because he was as excited as everyone else in the audience. What's that old saying? Show me the hottest two people having sex, and I'll show you a crowd of people who are sick of watching it. Unless, of course, it turns into a snuff show. <laughs> This is sounding less like a duck, and more like someone repeatedly stepping on a cat's tail. Plus, he's rude, too. He calls Lieutenant Williams when the lieutenant is very busy with a prostitute. Tell the truth. You were shooting your load with that horn of yours, weren't you? <laughs> Scrooge McDuck's grizzled hag of a wife sure has a mouth on her. Who the hell are you? Something tells me that the down and dirty duck got very bored of helping insurance agents get laid. Nothing can ruin these two's chemistry. Make me some coffee, will you? Sweetheart, I'm a prostitute, not your wife. You want coffee? You make it yourself. There's an extra 20 in it for you if you make me some damn coffee. Oh, don't be a dumb bitch, you know what I mean. Hey. Jesus Christ, dude, you're the hero of this movie. The least you could do is be respectful towards the prostitute you're cheating on your wife with. Turns out the tapes that Pussy Galore has been recording go to her rich husband. Every male in these giallos have eyes that say, I'm gonna rape you, poison you, or tickle you. Or all three. Good lord, that's a lot of porno theaters. I'm glad that these two have found each other. Meanwhile, Dr. Davis has a theory about the killer. One, he's quite good at uh, concealing his real personality, which means total self-control. Two, <laughs> he wants to provoke you. And three, likes to be noticed. So, he's good at doing voices, he likes to piss off the cops, and he wants people to find the bodies. Hmm. What the hell are we paying you for again? Maybe it'd be more helpful if you said he had the biggest moose knuckle you've ever seen. What's going on here? It's not like this movie to get sleazy on me. I tell you what, I buy you a beer, and my friend take you for a ride. And here's the part where she picks up the beer and throws it in his face. You lie, kid. Go on. Say it. Say it. Tell me you lie, kid. I lie. Or not. I may have to disagree with this movie. I'm not entirely convinced that women like to be foot raped. And here we go, yet another woman portrayed as a victim in a movie about a serial killer. What the hell, even the red herring is a rapist? And given that the lead detective is an unfaithful sleazeball, I'm not so sure that this movie specifically hates women, I think it just hates everyone. She should be safe, so long as she avoids the bathroom. That's where Joe Spinell is murdering a nurse. Why is she so scared? I'd kill to be chased by a funky soundtrack. That's right, I'd kill the person chasing me, which would stop me from being murdered, and I got a free soundtrack album out of it. Wait, you mean I could be watching A Werewolf in London and Nighthawk's double feature? Why am I stuck watching this movie about a killer duck? <laughs> You're nothing but a bad duck. But being stabbed multiple times is no excuse to be missing out on a good double feature. <laughs> What am I supposed to take from that? The killer was hiding in her crotch this whole time? Huh. Well, now I know who the killer is, I guess.
bad that he likes slicing people. Okay, movie, Jesus. If you keep this up, I'm gonna assume you like going overboard with the graphic violence. Ah, uh, it was all a dream, except for the duck part. That's real, unfortunately. This is Faye Majors, and the man in her dream was her boyfriend, Peter. You know, the guy who was gonna turn out to be the killer at the end. Don't get mad at me for spoiling it. The back of the box does, too. You came in and killed me. Yes, you were the murderer, darling. Well, forget the back of the box. The movie's good at spoiling itself. At least the three-fingered red herring is getting laid. Careful, though. Her vagina has a very serious foot fungus. The one thing worse than being set up with an obvious killer. The truth is, you escaped from a crazy son of a bitch who's murdered three women already. You were very lucky. What did the police have to say? They said the killer has the same dubbed voice as Ian Sarah from Pod People and Pieces. I thought you sounded familiar. The movie is way ahead of the times. Audio sex tapes are the way to go. It could make it to the press, yes, but no one could make fun of you for having a tiny penis. Some beds vibrate with force, others vibrate with amazing disco beats. She's noticed that he has two fingers missing, and is wondering if he broke them off somewhere. This is Mikas Skalenda, played by actor Howard Ross, who could also be seen in Christmas Vacation 95. Well, I imagine it's less embarrassing than Cousin Eddie's Island Adventure. I'm not sure what to make of this scene. It's just Dr. Davis buying a gay porn magazine and then leaving. Have a nice evening. I don't know if it's come out yet. Am I supposed to think that he's the killer because he likes gay porn? Are they banking on me being suspicious of him just because I've seen the movie Windows? If that's the case, then what rich husband is Elizabeth Ashley recording this shit for? I do know that they're banking on me having seen the Warriors. But, but first of all, I want to ask that dude with uh, two fingers missing on his right hand a big question. Man, why, baby? Please, leave the ladies alone. First, the DJ incorrectly accuses the Warriors, and now Skelenda? They're gonna have to rename your show the Sorry About That Boppers Hour. Careful, he's either looking sinister or he's having a heart attack. Or worse yet, he shit the bed. The rich dish escapes, and the hotel finally made use of that mirror that they installed to scare people who are running from killers. <laughs> Why the hell is he still trying to sound like a duck? The only person who can hear him is the victim, and she's not gonna tell anyone. Well, awkward. I'm sorry if I couldn't give you any better welcome, Lieutenant. It's okay, these porno tapes, your wife having sex with other men is more than enough. In fact, let's listen to some of them. <laughs> you're in a lot of trouble for bootlegging the soundtrack to the New York Ripper. But go ahead and tell us about the possible killer. Yeah, because your little hobby here, you now know the uh, Ripper's identity. Mikis Skalenda, a Greek. I know exactly where he is. Kiki's Restaurant, home of the best Greek duck in New York. They search Skalenda's apartment and find needles, which proves that his mattress is a heroin addict. We're not sure what this is, Detective, but we're positive it has something to do with getting the anus high. Ooh, it's date night, so Faye and Peter are gonna curl up by the fire and watch duck soup. You're pig-headed. No, duck-headed. Aside from the whole killer thing, Peter is just weird. In this country, if you're not good at something, at anything, if you're not the best, the smartest, or the toughest, that's it. You're screwed. <laughs> That's not true. Adam Sandler still made a career for himself. Dr. Davis soon stops by to get more info on Skelenda, as he believes, like we do, that Skelenda is not the killer. Why? What do you mean? You don't believe me? Just asking once more. Well, the movie obviously doesn't believe her since it just cut away from the answer. 
Instead, it needs to show more important scenes, like Peter and Faye engaging in sweet nothings. Sometimes I wonder how a girl like you, with an IQ of 182, <laughs> could be such a dummy. Great, so we got the done one version of that asshole we saw in the car earlier. It's you, baby. Your overpowering touch shorts out my brain circuits. <laughs> oh my god, it's like watching Mel Gibson flirt with Ray Lynn. Never thought I'd say this, but I want him to leave so he can go kill people. <laughs> she just got that he called her a dummy and she is pissed. She sneaks around the house, looking through more rooms, and oh, this is perfectly normal. Just a bunch of creepy dolls, so he's either the killer in this or in Don't Open the Door. But Skelenda then breaks into the house, and she makes the smart move of hiding under the bed. And, oh my god, where does he get such an amazing shine on those boots? <laughs> well, it can't be him. He doesn't sound like a duck. He sounds like an asshole. Again, just because the movie wants us to believe that you're the killer, doesn't mean you have to be killing people! Wait till Lieutenant Williams hears about this. Good night. Oh, gee, thanks. No police protection? Nothing? Meanwhile, the patrol car takes us on another tour of the greatest era of New York City. Hmm, do I choose between Black Jack Peep shows or Mean Drunken Master? How about I just strip off all my clothes and pleasure myself to Mean Drunken Master? Sounds like a night. Then I can move over to 60 Second Assassin and Revenge of the Bushido Blade. Should be over with quick. At least one of those movies is only a minute long. By the way, that's it for that scene. It only exists just to show us what other movies are playing on the same street that you're watching New York Ripper on. Although I take it the other movies don't have a duck voice. Here we go. It's for you. It's Duckman's agent. This script is a little too graphic for the USA Network. Thanks. However you disappoint me, duck. You throw a challenge my way. You don't have the guts to let me get there to watch the goings on. <laughs> okay, never mind the quacking. It's a little hard to make even the detective sound threatening when he's using the word duck in the middle of a sentence, even when the killer is using lines like this. What do you want? The dedicated killing to you. <laughs> oh, then you want to call the DJ for that? Please, anything by Rick Dees will do perfectly fine. The duck has taken Lieutenant William's favorite prostitute, Kitty, hostage. And holy crap! You didn't really expect to find me on the phone, did you? <laughs> bitch. The phone's been the killer this whole time? Lieutenant Williams races to rescue Kitty, and there's still some money left in the effects budget, so she probably won't make it. But this isn't zombie, so nothing bad should happen to an eyeball this time around. <laughs> Oops, you misunderstood me. I meant that since this is from the director of Zombie, that something bad will definitely happen to an eyeball. <laughs> I am terrible at trigger warnings. Skelenda's body then turns up after he committed suicide, so I guess that's that. Hey, Days! Bullshit, man! That's... that son of a bitch! He murdered Kitty four days ago! He can't be dead for eight days! You're wrong! Hmm. Side note, I have a feeling that actor Jack Headley's real voice sounds nothing like that. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, am I trespassing? Not really. Just as I suspected, in real life he's dubbed by Michael Sheen. By the way, what's Dr. Davis up to during all this? You think according to fixed patterns? Like a cup. Okay, we know you're not the killer, so maybe you should be giving this advice to Lieutenant Williams and not us. Faye goes to the hospital to interrogate a duck toy. It's possible it could be the killer. Meanwhile, there's the face of a child whose parents took her to go see the New York Ripper. See? This is what happens when you get into prostitution, kid. Goodwill stabbing, on the other hand, is just making up shit on a chalkboard so that we'll think he's smart. Faye finds a chip knife that fits perfectly in the spot where the killer attempted to stab her, and the police figure out the killer's motive. It's that his daughter is disfigured, so he goes on a murderous rampage, killing beautiful women to avenge his daughter for having a disease. 
She'll never grow up to be a woman. Now I understand. True. After surgery, you are no longer a woman. You are just a thing. But the movie still tries to fool us into thinking Peter's not the killer. Hello? This is the little duck. How are you? We haven't played in such a long time. Don't worry, that'll get explained. And it's fucking ridiculous. Faye immediately stabs him and takes a huge gamble that he's the killer. I mean, we know for sure that he is, but that's still a huge gamble on her part. <laughs> You're like, you're like all the rest of them, young and beautiful and healthy. While that should be enough to convince her that he's the killer, a dubbed voice could go over anybody. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Well, it doesn't matter now. Peter is way dead. Okay, so that person who called him, yeah, that was supposed to be the daughter in the hospital playing the game of ducks, which she likes to play with her father. So you're telling me that this voice... This is the little duck. How are you? We haven't played in such a long time. ...is the same as this voice. Daddy, please don't leave me alone. Please. Please answer. I buy that about as much as I buy that Peter Bark is a child. And then there were no more murders in New York City. In putting all the onus on the duck, he wasn't the one who was responsible. The duck became a kind of outside avenger for his daughter who would never become like other women. Mm, yes, it's what we call ripping off the last scene in Psycho Syndrome. Except, well, I don't know if this final scene is a ripoff of anything. <laughs> And then the kid died alone in the hospital with no one by her side. <laughs> the end. So that was definitely a movie that hated women and cops and amputees and children and dogs and coroners and marriage. But none of that would make for a good blog entry, so it hates women. Well, it certainly would if the Ripper was the hero of the movie, but obviously the hero of the movie was the poor police chief who just wanted the lieutenant to give Edward Mannix's voice back to him. There is a lot of violence towards women in this movie, which is completely easy to get around when you're doing a movie about a serial killer who preys on women. And the villain is quickly discovered and stabbed repeatedly by a woman at the end of the film, so I see nothing misogynistic here. You women should stay home where you belong. You're a menace to the public. He used a blade. He stuck it up her joy trail. Oh, don't be a dumb bitch. You know what I mean. How a girl like you, with an IQ of 182, <laughs> could be such a dummy. Hmm. Well, there is that. But one person's misogyny may be another person's Giallo Rulebook 101, which clearly states that all of your characters must be irredeemable assholes. It makes it much harder to figure out who the killer is, even when it's incredibly obvious who the killer is. So the outcome may be this. If the New York Ripper offends you, then it's definitely sexist. But if it doesn't offend you, it's a sleazy movie with fantastic cinematography. Or maybe it just doesn't make sense to care about the morals in a 42nd Street sleaze flick. Or maybe it's just really, really good at being really, really offensive. Only the best sleaze flicks entertain you enough to make you okay with taking a good long shower after you've watched it. <laughs> or, so I've heard, I'm just a cinema snob who has seen one too many of these movies that I'm now completely numb to it. And I'm very, very offended. I don't know what the hell girls see in that guy. The trouble is, they only get to see him once. 